Thank you.
Good morning and welcome everyone. Welcome to the Merivale Fellowfield Pastoral Charge on this fourth Sunday in Lent. Our pastoral charge welcomes everyone who seeks a deeper connection to the divine mystery that is known to us through Jesus. We welcome you to explore your relationship with God while enjoying being in community with others who follow the same path. We try our best to promote God's inclusive love and our hearts are open to everyone, so we hope you will find comfort worshipping with us. If you are planning to attend the in-person services next week, the 26th of March, we will once again be at Fallowfield United. On Palm Sunday, April 2nd, we will be at Merivale United. We will also worship at Merivale on Monday, Thursday, April 6th at 7 p.m. On Good Friday, April 7th, we will gather at Fallowfield for a 10.30 a.m. service. And we will celebrate Easter Sunday at Fallowfield at our regular time. In other announcements, Merrillville is having a craft vendor market and luncheon on April 29th from 9 until 3. Questions or table rental queries may be directed to events at Merrillville 2 at gmail.com. Merrillville's plant sale is on May 27th from 9 until noon. Now would be a good time for people to start dividing their indoor plants for contributing. Drop-off for plants will be Friday, May 26th from 10 until noon, or they may be placed under the trees in the parking lot. As a caring pastoral charge, we do our best to help the many organisations in our city that need donations now more than ever. The Elizabeth Fry Society, Centre 507 and the Ottawa Mission are just a few that need your generosity during these difficult times. You can find a list of these community services and more on our website. If you would like to donate to the ch church, you can do so online by e-transfer to muchurch at belnet.ca or you can send a cheque to either Merivale or Fallowfield Church. You will find the address for each church on our website, www.merivalefallowfield.org. These are all the announcements at this time, and you can find them on our website. We hope that you will now sit back and enjoy the worship service that is all about commitment to making the world a caring place. Lighting the Candle of Peace. May the flame from this candle keep our feet firmly on the way where God leads us. Mm -hmm. 
May it help our words speak the truth that Jesus teaches us. May it fill our bodies with the life that is the Holy Spirit within us. Amen. Please join me for our opening prayer. Creator God, during these final weeks of Lent, you invite us into a time of conversion and reflection upon our relationship with you and with others. And so we pray that you will help us to embrace the gift of your grace that makes all things possible. We know deep in our hearts that your grace is our life force. And so we come to this virtual service ready to be in the presence of your Holy Spirit. Your Spirit calls each one of us by name and urges us to build community that honors the commandment of Jesus to love one another. Quiet our hearts today, give rest to our souls, and refresh our spirits, we pray. Help us to be intentional with our time of worship and encourage us to find the peace that surpasses all understanding as we listen to your voice that comes through song, reflection, and word. Hear us now, O God, as we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen.
Our first reading is from 1 Samuel, chapter 3, verses 1 to 9, and also 19 to 21. And the title of the reading is Samuel's Calling and Prophetic Activity. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel, and he said, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But Eli said, I did not call. Lie down again. So Samuel went down and laid down. The Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But, But Eli said, I did not call my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was a trustworthy prophet of the Lord. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. Herein is wisdom.
Good morning again. Our next reading is from 1 Samuel, chapter 16, 1 to 13. And the title of the passage is King David. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The, elder of the, of the, the elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, Do you come peaceably? And he said, Peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on the lib and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks upon the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And, he, and Jesse said, There remains yet the youngest, but he's keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. Herein is good news. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts always be aligned with your love, O God, for you are our rock and our redeemer and our courage and our freedom. Amen. Today we are focusing on the two books of Samuel. Now in English Bibles, the book is usually divided into First and Second Samuel. But in Jewish tradition, Samuel is one book. This book is considered to be both historical and literary work. It starts with a look at the leadership of the prophet Samuel. 
And Samuel was the last judge in Israel's history, and he ushered in the period of kingship. Now, most of the book of Samuel focuses on the rise and the fall of King David. And the events recorded in this book are certainly not considered historical by critical scholars. However, the book does record a critical period in Israelite history, the transition from a theocracy or state ruled by religious leaders to a monarchy or state ruled by political leader. The book of Samuel portrays the inherent tension in Israelite monarchy and the transition from the era of the judges to kingship was turbulent to say the least. In our readings up to date, there always seemed to be a tension between the people's obedience to God and what they wanted in terms of practicality and politically. In our story, the Israelites demand that Samuel appoint a king for them so that Israel will be like other nations. Samuel is not the least bit happy about this, but God tells him to go ahead and elect a king. And God assures Samuel that the people are not rejecting him or his leadership. And in fact, they are rejecting God's wisdom. Samuel warns the people that a monarchy brings certain drawbacks such as taxation, the conscription of armed forces, and the potential for tyranny. But the people are resolute. They want a king. And so Samuel anoints Saul as king. Now, despite many military victories, Saul soon disobeys God. And Samuel then informs Saul that he is going to be replaced by another king. God then leads Samuel to the town of Bethlehem to choose a new king. And God instructs Samuel, while he's choosing a king, not to judge people by their external appearances, but rather by their hearts. Samuel breaking with tradition, anoints Jesse's youngest son, David, who is a shepherd, and David is anointed as king. A side note, Jesse is the grandson of Boaz and Ruth, who we learned about last week, and Jesse was a farmer and a sheep breeder in Bethlehem. He is also mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew's genealogy that traces the family tree of Jesus through Jesse and King David. Anyhow, in our story, David is anointed king, and God gives divine powers to David. So Saul represents Israel's failed attempt at monarchy, and David represents God's ideal king because David places a higher value on religious devotion than on the physical world. Like Abraham and Moses, David reinforces God's ongoing preference for the unseen over the seen, the lesser over the greater, and the inner faith over external circumstances. Now, a major theme running through our travels with the prophets, and now our travels with King David, is the question of what lies in our hearts. In our reading from 1 Samuel 16, when Samuel is to pick a king, God says to him, God does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. So that is what makes a good leader. And that for me is what makes a good human being. It is what lies in our hearts. We all make mistakes and mess up during our lives. But what counts, what really counts and what matters is what is happening in our hearts right now. What is happening in our hearts today, in our present lives? Our scriptures challenge us to see the world like God does, rather than from a normal human perspective. And encounters with God move us beyond what we might have previously thought about something or someone. And just like God calls Samuel to step out of his comfort zone and live from his heart, God calls us to do the same. So, how do we know what should lie in our hearts? Well, Jesus tells us that loving God and our neighbor is one way of building up our hearts to be what God would have them be. And classical Buddhist teachings say that loving kindness, compassion, appreciative joy, 
And a particular form of equanimity are the four kinds of love that should lie in our hearts. None of these are uniquely Buddhist or Christian. They are four qualities of heart that reside within everyone, at least as potentials. And looking at the Jewish tradition, a great first century sage postulated the balanced tripod of Jewish living, which is living by truth, living by justice, living by peace, or living by Torah, worship, and deeds of kindness and compassion. The idea is that there are three H's of Jewish life, head, heart, and hands. The head stands for intellectual engagement with Judaism or serious Jewish study. The heart represents prayer, worship, and liturgy. And the hands stand for social justice initiatives and acts of kindness and service to others. To me, that is living by the heart. Engaging with your intellect by studying your faith tradition seriously, engaging with your heart, which is putting your faith tradition into practice, and finally, engagement with your hands, which is living from the heart by acts of kindness and service to others. Indigenous knowledge keeper Chief Darrell Bob said, the longest journey we will ever make as human beings is a journey from the mind to the heart. And he said this as he challenged top North American scientists to step outside of their academic mindset and enter into the world of indigenous peoples. He was quoting another elder and was reflecting on an indigenous system of thought that is guided by values and laws written in nature, a system that transcends tribal boundaries. And I would say this system of thought transcends all human boundaries. Our scriptures, which include the Hebrew scriptures, challenge us to see the world like God does, rather than from a narrow human perspective. Living from the heart or seeing the world like God does is when we reflect on what we cherish. And often what we cherish is having relationships with others, being in community, creativity, wisdom, wonder, seeing life as a miracle, living fully, and living a life of compassionate service to others. And all of these are sourced in a sacred embodied presence that many of us call God. So the question for me then is, what practices, spiritual or otherwise, can we embrace in our lives that would encourage us to live from the heart? Amen.
Please join me for our closing prayer. God of renewal and transformation, as we come to the end of our worship, remind us of all the places and people in our lives that give us reasons to be thankful. May we always be grateful for this sacred hour of worship and for all the places and spaces in our lives where we experience awe. We know that these sacred spaces teach us that grace and beauty exist in this world if we but open our hearts to their existence. May the teachings of Jesus remind us that we are all valued members of your beloved community and that we are made in your image of love and compassion. May we be grateful for these teachings of Jesus that help us to live up to reflecting your image in our world. As we now reflect on another winter slipping by, may the joys and blessings of this season stay with us as we take a breath and recommit to our mission of nurturing our spirits in community, in caring for one another and ourselves, and in helping to heal the divisions of the world in which we dwell. And now, O oh God, we just take a moment of silence to offer up to you our own individual prayers. And now as we head out of worship, may we do so with the assurance that God loves us, that Jesus is our faithful guide, and that the Holy Spirit continually offers us abundant grace. Amen.
now as we head out from this worship service, may we follow the teachings of Jesus, always walking the path of justice, speaking words of love, living selflessly, walking gently upon the earth, and filling the world with compassion. Amen.